All right, so here at the start, we're taking a look at uh, a particular rational expression. We're going to be simplifying this. Uh, today's theme is going to be just kind of reminding ourselves how some rational expression stuff works as we start class, since this came up on one of your recent assignments, the last wall map. And some people were having trouble with it, so it seemed like we needed some refreshers on this. We'll go through these problems, hopefully, on the quicker side. Then we'll be practicing our difference quotient a little bit more after that. Now, when you first look at this one, Hopefully, you started by factoring it. So, you know that you're going to end up with something that looks like this, right? If you haven't yet factored it, do so now. Now, if you don't remember any of those particular methods that we use, like regrouping or whatever, uh, you can always do kind of a guess and check thing. Like, I know that these first two terms, these need to multiply to give me the 6. So I would we'll just kind of do a guess and check thing. So I might try like 3 and 2 there. So I'll put a 3 there or a 2 there. And then I could just start guessing and checking about what would go to multiply to the 12. Because that is what these two numbers will be. These need to multiply 12. And the answer is going to be the one where I can actually get the negative 17 there in the middle. And so we can try stuff for the negative 12. One thing that you might be tempted to try right at the start is like 3 and 4. But would you want to try 3 and 4 like that? No. There's actually a hint here. Notice that out of the start of this one, I couldn't factor anything out of every single term. Like I couldn't divide everything by 2 at the start or anything like that. That tells me that I can't be able to divide the same thing out of both terms within one of these binomials either. So like notice, both of those are divisible by 2. Actually, both of these are also divisible by 3. That's not going to be the case in my final factored form. So if I'm going to try 3 and 4, I don't even want to bother trying it in that order. But I would actually want to try switching the order and see if that matters. And if I do that, it's looking promising. Because the 3 times the 3, that gives me the 9. And the 4 times the 2, that gives me the 8. And 9 and 8 is going to add to 17. Just notice it needs to be a negative 17. So we make them both minuses. And, of course, what if the 3 and the 4 didn't work? Well, then I'd try maybe 2 and 6, and then 1 and 12. But if none of those worked, well, then maybe instead of 3 and 2, I would have tried 1 and 6, and then gone through all those options again. So it's a matter of really kind of a guess and check, and, of course, the more you do of these, the better your instincts will get. All right, so looking at that bottom one, I'm guessing most of us would start by trying, like, 3 and 5 for getting the 15. So I'm going to try that. And so then it's just a matter of, again, how do I want to get the 12? Uh, for this one, again, you might try 3 and 4. That's often where we start. Instinctively, most people tend to go to that as a multiple for 12. Do I want to put the 3 here? No. Notice, that would make both of them divisible by 3. That's a big hint that I don't need to do that. So if I'm going to try 3 and 4, I'm going to try 3 and 4. And then I'm just going to test that out and see what that gives me. And so notice the 5 and the 4, that gives me 20. The 3 and the 3, that gives me 9. Well, notice I'm multiplying to a negative 12 in this case. And if I'm going to multiply to a negative, that means that one of these must be positive and the other one must be negative. And my first guess happens to be the right guess then. And of course, that isn't always the case. If it doesn't work, then you just go on and try the next combination. That was the hard part of this problem. From here, it's easy, or at least I hope it is. Because really what we're doing is we're now just looking to see what can I cancel out of both the top and the bottom. And notice that two of those parentheses, one set from the top and from the bottom, is the same. And so I can go ahead and cancel those. And if I do so, I end up with 2x minus 3 over 5x plus 3. Uh, question here. Can I cancel out these threes? No. Because remember, in order to be able to cancel something out of top and bottom, I would have to be able to cancel out of every single term in both the top and the bottom. So no, we cannot cancel out the threes. For the same reason, we cannot cancel out the x's here. This is as good as it gets. Now, if we want to be very particular, though, we would also include restrictions. Because, yes, 
That is the simplified form, provided that x does not equal negative three-fifths or four-thirds. So now we're looking at another one that could be simplified. Continuing on with the same kind of idea of simplifying a rational expression. Write it down, do it on your own first. And the first hint, and the big idea of this is, you want to start by looking to see, is there anything that you can divide every single term on both top and bottom by? So start by looking for that. And when you start doing that, when I look at all six terms, everything on the top and the bottom, the number that goes into all the numbers that I see up there would be 5. And then I look at the x's and I say, how many x's can I pull out of every term? And it looks like I could pull 4 x's out of every single term. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to actually be reducing this fraction by canceling out 5x to the fourths from every single term. And so basically what I'm doing then is I'm factoring 5x to the fourth out of every term on the top and out of every term on the bottom. So on the top then, the 10x to the eighth. If I take the 10 divided by 5, of course that gives me 2. x to the eighth divided by x to the fourth is x to the fourth. Remember that when I divide x's, I'm subtracting their exponents. And if you got that one down, then the rest are going to flow fairly quickly. So then it ends up being... 5x squared plus 3x. Then on the bottom, again, I'm factoring 5x to the fourth out of every single term. And if I do that, then 6x to the fifth plus 4x cubed. <coughs> now we have a question. And this is sometimes a stumbling point for us. Do I end it there? No. And, but that is actually the error that I see a lot of people make, because right now, if I just ended the parenthesis there, notice that does not equal this, because if I multiply that 5x to the fourth back in, I don't get the same thing. I would get this, but I wouldn't get that plus 5x to the fourth on the end, which is why we have to include a plus 1 there. And why is it a 1? Because anything divided by itself is still 1. And so then, notice, by factoring out 5x to the 4th out of both top and bottom, I'm basically then canceling that out to be left with my final answer. <coughs> and again, we might consider the restrictions on this one. Uh, what could x not equal in this problem? Yeah, just 0. That's the only thing we have to worry about. And so now on to solving with the rationals. Quick refresh about how we approach this. Write it down and start working it through on your own. All right, so as you're looking at solving this one, first step, make it just a single fraction on each side. So on the right side then, I got to do the subtraction. In order to subtract fractions, what do I need? Common denominator. Yep. The only way to get a common denominator in this case is to multiply them by each other. And that means that in that first fraction, I have to multiply top and bottom of that fraction by the x plus 2. And then for the second fraction, I have to multiply top and bottom of that one by the x minus 8. Because if I'm going to multiply it into the bottom, I have to multiply it into the top as well. Hence how we get that result from there. Then you can go ahead and do the subtraction, and then you can start solving at that point. Now, once we have the common denominator, we're doing the subtraction. Be careful when you do this subtraction, or you could actually end up with an error that's going to be a pain to fix. Because notice I am subtracting everything over here. And so when I do the combining the like terms on the top here, I'm going to have to do 5x minus 3x. Okay, we're usually pretty good about doing that part. But we're also going to have to do the 10 minus a negative 24. 
So really you're going to be doing 10 plus 34 when you combine on the top here. And once we're here, we have a fraction equal to a fraction, which means you can cross multiply. So you will go ahead and multiply the whole x plus 2 by the whole 2x plus 34. Think about it as parentheses times parentheses, so make sure you're multiplying everything in the first, bear everything in the second. And then multiply the 1 by the x squared minus 6x minus 16. When you do that multiplication, this is what you should be looking at. And then it's a matter of how do we solve this. And we have quadratics. Well, if I want to solve a quadratic, I'm going to try setting the whole equation equal to zero. So I'm going to move everything to the same side. Personally, I'm going to move everything to the left side here just because that's going to keep my x squared term positive. And I would like to keep my x squared term positive. It makes the factoring that I try to do a lot easier. Once you get that quadratic set equal to zero, do try factoring it first. You can always use quadratic formula, but quadratic formula is just more prone to errors than factoring is. So always try factoring it first. And yes, this one actually is factorable. I chose to make this one nice and factorable. And so when we factor it, you end up getting x plus 42 times x plus 2, which means then that our solutions our x equals negative 42 and negative 2, right? Kind of. One of those is right and one of those is wrong. Do you remember how we can know? Think restrictions, right? If I had just been simplifying this, I'd, I'd go back and I'd look and see, okay, what was the restrictions up here? And, like, I can see that I had x minus 8 and x plus 2 in my denominator up here. And just based on that, I can know that x cannot equal 8 or negative 2. But notice, the negative 2 was one of the solutions I found. And so the negative 2 is actually extraneous. So the only actual solution here is just x equals negative 42. All right, now that was rational equations, rational expressions. Uh, there's one other thing with rationals that's going to come up, although it hasn't in your assignments yet, but it will soon, and it'll even be a theme during this year, is rational exponents. And making sure we remember how to deal with some of these rules. So, write down these three problems, and then we're going to do these three together just as a quick reminder and review. And then we'll be bringing some more of these back again tomorrow to help remind ourselves how some of these things work. All right, and looking at these three problems, I kind of think the first one's probably the hardest of them, if we're going to be very technical. So I'm actually going to save that one for a moment, and I'm going to start in the middle. I'm going to start with our cube root of x to the seventh. Now, there's a few different ways that people think about doing this sort, and they're all valid. Well, provided they, of course, are correct mathematically. But there, you can use different methods. But I'm going to show you one particular method, partly because it's also going to educate us on how to do that first one. Uh, and that is, I'm going to start by turning this into a rational exponent. The cube root of x to the seventh is the same as x to the power of seven thirds. Remember that your radical, that's your denominator. The exponent on the inside, that's your numerator, when you write it as a fractional exponent. All right, now that I have that, I'm going to take that fraction, and I'm going to think of it as a mixed number right now. In fact, I'm even going to write it as a mixed number. 7 thirds. Well, 3 goes into 7 twice, with 1 left over. So, x to the 7 thirds is the same as x to the 2 and 1 third, which means that x to the 2 and a third is the same as x squared times x to the 1 third. Because, of course, when I multiply the x's, I add their exponent. So, if I want to undo that, I can just change it into multiplication, which means then, to get my final answer, the x squared, that's the part that I was looking for. That's that whole number part that I was trying to simplify out of this. The x to the one-third, I don't want to leave a fractional exponent in my answer. I need to get rid of the rational exponent. And so, I'm going to turn that back into a radical, and the one-third power is just the cube root. So that's x squared 
times the cube root of x. And that's it. That is our answer for that one. And again, others of you might have done it other ways. Uh, some of you will say, okay, well, how many sets of three can I pull out of seven right at the start? And you'll see that you can pull two sets out with just one x left behind to get that answer. That's perfectly fine. Notice that's actually what we did doing this method as well. When I turned it into a mixed number, I said, how many times does three go into seven? And how many were left over? So it's the same idea, just a different way of representing it. But I like showing it this way because that's not going to help us deal with this. All right. So first up, I got a negative in my exponent. The negative, of course, in the exponent, remember, means that it turns it into the reciprocal of it. So this is going to be 1 over x to the 11 fourths. But now we want to simplify that x to the 11 fourths. I'm basically at this point up here, and I need to get it down to this. So I'm going to turn it into a mixed number. So that's going to be 1 over, so it's going to stay 1 over. And then how many times does 4 go into 11? Goes in twice with how many left over? 3. And so it's x to the 2 and 3 fourths. So that's x squared times x to the 3 fourths. Okay. So if I turn that back in a radical form, I have x squared and then the fourth root of x cubed. But well, this is actually good, and for a lot of this year, later on during the year, we're actually going to be all stopped at this point and call it good. Technically, in order to be totally simplified, we can't stop here. Because remember, we don't want to leave a radical in the denominator of our fraction. So I need to get the radical out of there. Which means i got to multiply that by something. What can I multiply that fourth root of x cubed by? in order to make it no longer a radical. And now the way to think about it is 3 fourths plus what is a whole? It's 1 fourth, right? So I'm going to be multiplying the top and bottom then by the fourth root of x. You could also write it as x to the 1 fourth. That does, of course, mean the same thing. And of course, what I do to the bottom, I must also do to the top, so I multiply top and bottom by that same radical. So then that now gives me the fourth root of x on the top over, well, that would be x squared times x now. Okay, well, what does x squared times x equal? x cubed, right? So then this whole bottom then is just going to become x cubed. We now have no more negative exponents. We have no more fractions in our exponents. And we have no radicals in our denominator. This is simplified. Lots of little embedded pieces in there. But hopefully all review, hopefully kind of coming back as we go about it. Yes, this is actually a skill that you're going to have to be able to use a lot this year. Uh, adding and subtracting rational exponents is going to be a theme at a certain point. It's going to allow you to do some things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. But before we get into the new stuff from this year, we do have to finish our last little bit of review. This one right here. Now, I will say, one way you could go about this is you could actually start by just doing 3 to the 7th on your calculator and 27 cubed on your calculator and start reducing. Kind of big numbers, kind of a pain, but it's doable. But the, you can actually do this without your calculator, right? You see how, right? If not, think about how. It's all about this 27. Because, really, I'm going to turn this into 3 to the power of 7th over, but instead of writing that as 27, since the top is 3 to the power of something, and I see that 27 is 3 to the power of something. 27 is actually 3 to the power of what? 3. 3 cubed. And so that 3 cubed is then being cubed. Well, that means that this is 3 to the 7th over 3 to the... When I do a power to a power, what do I do with those two powers? 
we multiply those exponents. So that becomes over 3 to the ninth. Now this is a lot easier to do. Because now I can just cancel out 3s out of top and bottom. I can cancel 7 of them out of the top. And 7 out of the bottom. That leaves me on the bottom with 3 squared. But of course, 3 squared is just 9. So the whole thing just works out to be 1 ninth. And yes, you could get that the long way, but why? When you can make the life easier this way. And again, I'm writing out lots of work up here just to try to make the explanation kind of clear. But for most of you, when you start seeing this kind of pattern, it, you're probably actually gonna, just going to go straight from the first problem to that to that. And you're going to be doing a lot of this stuff in your head, and it's going to go quick, and it's going to be a lot easier. So don't think because I'm writing out a ton that it's really a long process. It's actually going to be pretty short. Last week we talked about difference quotient. We are going to continue working with difference quotient. Let's see how well you can remember it. Please, without looking at your notes, can you write out the difference quotient? I ask because you are going to need to know difference quotient. It's going to start coming up as we start getting into the real calculus portions here. It's kind of the base for the calculus work that we're going to be doing. And so this is what you should have down. Should come up with f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Yes, get to know it. Get to know it in this form. There are a few different ways you can remember it. Like I see some of you where you'll actually write it out the long way, where on the bottom you'll write it out as a plus h minus a, which is fine, but you're going to be giving yourself a little bit of extra work that way, and it's going to make it a little bit tougher to look at as we start utilizing this here this week. So this form is definitely the preferred form. Now I'd like you to utilize the difference quotient. Please evaluate and simplify the difference quotient for this equation. f of x equals the square root of x. So when we plug it into the difference quotient here, we have the square root of a plus h minus the square root of a all over h. And then we just look to simplify however we can. Although in this case, there's not really much simplification we can do, right? I mean, there's ways we can manipulate it, but none of it's really going to make it any simpler than what we have right now. So we're going to go ahead and call that good. So we've got our difference quotient. So now having seen that, please evaluate it for the value of f of 4. So we're looking specifically at the location starting at 4. So in the last problem, we found that we have the square root of a plus h plus the square root of a over h is our general formula. The 4 here, when we talk about evaluating at a specific point like this, like f of 4, what it's doing is it's telling us that the 4 is our a value. And so it's telling me to go back to this formula then and plug 4 in for a. And then simplify as you can in that case. Quite right. Thank you. Yes, I miswrote it when I wrote it over here, didn't I? That should be a minus there. Thank you. All right, now what can we simplify? Uh, can I simplify this square root of 4 right here? No. Because that's not a square root of 4. That's a square root of 4 plus h right there. I would have to do the 4 plus h before I took the square root. So at least for now, unless I know what h is, I have to leave it as the square root of 4 plus h. All right, then the minus. Then, can I simplify that square root of 4? Yes, that one I can simplify because it's just the square root of 4. So that's going to become a 2, and this is all over h still. So now if I told you, okay, starting out a value of 4, uh, if we go 0.1 units to the right, what will the value of the difference quotient be? You could easily plug that point 0.1 in for h and give me an answer. So that's what we're given now. That's what we're able to work with. Last week, all of the difference quotient problems we did were nice, pretty little polynomials, especially quadratics, right? This week, we're going to be throwing in non-polynomial equations. So let's take a look at what would happen if we deal with a rational equation. Please. Evaluate and simplify the difference quotient for this one. All 
All right, so when we just plug into the difference quotient, this is what we're looking at. Can this be simplified? Well, I know you're hoping I say no, but it's actually yes, we can simplify this. So please simplify this expression. Hint, start by making it just a single fraction on the top. And so when I get a common denominator on the top to allow me to do the subtraction, I end up with a denominator of a times a plus h, so that means I'm multiplying the top and bottom of the first fraction on the top by a, and the second fraction by the a plus h. Now, go ahead and do that subtraction. And again, be careful when doing the subtraction of fractions like this, because I'm subtracting the 2a, and I'm subtracting the 2h. Don't lose track of that part. Right, and so when we do that, uh, the 2a minus the 2a, that just goes away. And I'm left with nothing minus 2h. That's a negative 2h. That's all over the same denominator, and that's all over h. Well, we can still simplify this. Because I can now go ahead and do the fraction divided by h. If I'm going to divide by h, that's the same thing as multiplying it into the denominator. Because I have negative 2h over a a plus h, and I'm dividing it by h, right? Well, remember, dividing is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, so that's the same as multiplying by 1 over h, which is why that h ends up in the bottom, or if you see this coming right now, you can see that we can cancel the h on the top with that h on the bottom, which you will do eventually, it's just a matter of whether you do the multiplication first or cancel in the process of doing it. But when you do that, you end up with a negative 2 on the top and just an a times a plus h on the bottom. And then that's it. That's our final answer. Although, you know, I tend not to like to leave a negative sitting in the top like that. So I'll take that negative. I'll write it out front of the whole fraction. Because, of course, if the top is negative, that means the whole fraction is negative. Yes, you are welcome to distribute the a. If you wrote your answer as a negative 2 over a squared plus a h, perfectly fine, perfectly right. Good. Thank you for that question. Now on to our last problem for the day. What I'd like you to do is now evaluate and simplify the difference quotient for the same formula we just used, except now at f of 4. We're being told that part. All right, and you can see up here what you get is the final answer. Check that, make sure it's all looking good. So notice this one ends up being a much simpler equation once we plug that in. If I gave you some h value, it'd now be very doable to figure out what that answer would be. It's much easier now that we simplified it, right? And that's what often will be the case when doing these different quotient problems is that we will be looking at cases where, okay, now that you've gotten the general formula, what is the slope through these 10 points? all between 4 and some other point. And so a nice, small, simple formula like this is going to make that job a whole lot easier.